All right, welcome back everybody. In this video, we're continuing with section 4.2 and looking at the multiplication rule. So uh, we saw that for one event or another, we were basically going to add probabilities. We had to uh, do a subtraction if the two events weren't mutually exclusive, but basically if you're looking for one event or another occurring, then that is uh, an addition of probabilities. In this section, uh, or in this part of the section for this video, we're going to see that for one event and another, uh, in general, multiplication is used. Of course, there's some detail there that we'll have to take care of, but basically it's multiplication for and and addition for or. All right, so let's get started. So the first kind of uh, piece that we're going to need is another notation. And that is uh, as follows. So uh, P, uh, a and B, that's a probability of event A and B occurring. Uh, then P, a B, and then a vertical bar, and then A. That vertical bar is kind of like half the absolute value symbol. It's just a vertical bar. You read that out loud as given or given that. And so this would be probability of B given that A has already occurred. Okay, so uh, it says interpret B bar A as event B occurring after the event A has already occurred, or B given A. Okay, so uh, if you've got those two pieces together, the probability of A and B is the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B given A. So basically we have to multiply the probabilities together, but when we do the probability of B, we're doing it under the assumption that A has already occurred. Okay. So uh, that basically is how that goes. Um, best way to see how this goes is with examples. Okay, so let's say that we have uh, a jar of 24 cookies. In it, there are 12 Oreos, there are eight chocolate chips, four peanut butter. We're going to choose two cookies from the jar, okay? And of course, we're not going to, um, let's say that we can't feel them, okay? We're, we're gonna not look, we'll use tongs or something else, okay? Or somebody else is picking them out for us and they're not gonna tell us what they are. So anyways, we got two cookies. We're gonna pick them out. We don't know if they're Oreos or peanut butter or what cookies they are. We're just picking out the two cookies. Okay, A is the event that the first cookie is an Oreo cookie. B is the event that the second cookie is a peanut butter cookie. And E is the event that the second is an Oreo cookie. Okay, so we want first the probability of A and B. So this will be the probability of A times the probability of B given that A has already happened. Okay, so probability of A first. Okay, the probability that the first cookie is an Oreo. So there were 24 cookies and 12 of them are Oreos. So it's 12 out of 24. That's the probability that the first cookie was an Oreo. So now the probability of B given A. So B is the second cookie's peanut butter. So we want to know the probability that the second cookie is a peanut butter given that the first one was an Oreo. Okay. And so the, that's the thing um, that is easily confused here is um, peanut butter. There are four peanut butter cookies, that's true. But since we're assuming that A has already occurred, that means that there are only 23 cookies left in the jar. Okay, it's not gonna be on top of 24. Why? Because we're picking out two cookies. When we go to pick out the second cookie, there's only 23 left in the jar. So it's four out of 23. Okay, so then multiplying all that out, you get uh, two out of 23. Okay, let me give you a decimal for that. All right, so I've turned it back into a decimal, so just to make it a little bit easier for you to visualize, it's about 0 0.087. Okay, next up, we'll be doing the probability of A and E occurring. Okay, the probability that the first cookie is an Oreo times the probability that the second is an Oreo given that the first one was. Okay, to start off, the probability of A is the same as before. It's 12 out of 24. And then the probability that the second is an Oreo, given that the first one was. All right, so now, not only are there only 23 cookies left, since the first one we picked out was an Oreo, 
there's not 12 in the jar anymore. There's only 11 Oreos left in the jar. So it's 11 out of 23. So let's see what we get as a decimal. All right, so that's about 0.239. All right, so here you'll notice that the uh, we do have to adjust uh, our count uh, based on uh, that first uh, part of the experiment. Okay, uh, moving on, another example. Suppose that we're going to toss a coin and roll a die at the same time. A is the event that the coin comes out tails. B is the event that the die comes up a five. We want the probability of A and B. So that'll be the probability of A times the probability of B given that A occurred. Okay, the probability of A occurring, the coin coming up tails. Well, there are two possibilities for the coin out of which one is tails, so one half. For the second part, we want to know the probability that the die comes out of five given that the coin came out tails. So you gotta think about that for a second. If the coin comes out tails, does that uh, influence uh, the likelihood that the uh, die is a five or not? No, one has nothing to do with the other, right? So the probability is still one sixth, okay? So that is one twelfth, which is about 0 0.083. Okay, so there's a big difference in this problem versus the cookie one, aside from the fact that one is cookies and the other one isn't, is um, the, the two events in the second part are what's called independent, whereas the events in the cookie example are not independent. And that's um, our definition coming uh, next. Okay, two events A and B are independent if the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of the occurrence of the other. Several events as he's extending it to more than just two, several events are similarly independent if the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of occurrence of the others. If A and B are not dependent, independent, then they're dependent, okay? So this is an example of a use of a word that has uh, multiple meanings. Even in math, uh, you'll see independent and dependent applied to like systems of equations based on whether the lines intersect or not. Um, everyday usage, there's everyday usage for the words independent and dependent. Um, for uh, probability, for events, independent means basically like the die and the coin that we just had a minute ago, that knowing the occurrence of one doesn't affect uh, the probability of occurrence of the other. If that's not true, that is knowing the probability of one uh, does affect the probability of occurrence of the other, then they're dependent. Okay, independent and dependent are opposites here. Also, one thing worth mentioning is be careful not to get confused between mutually exclusive and independent. Mutually exclusive means that two events can't happen simultaneously. Independent means that the two events could happen at the same time, or maybe they don't, but the probability of one occurring is not affected by the occurrence of the other. Okay, examples. Okay, suppose that a die is rolled. A is the event you get an even number, and B is uh, the event you get a number greater than three. We want to know if A and B are independent events. Okay, clearly they're not mutually exclusive, right? You get a four. A four is both even and bigger than three, so it's not mutually exclusive. That's not at issue here. We want to know if these two are uh, independent or not. Okay, so basically um, a way to think about independent versus dependent is uh, in symbols actually helps. Um, there, A and B are independent if the probability of A, given that B occurs, is the same as the probability of A. That is, knowing about B doesn't help you decide on A. But if uh, knowing about B does help you decide about A, that is the probability of A given B is not the same as the probability of A, then the two are um, dependent. All right, so example. So the probability of A, if you roll a die, the probability of getting an even number is a half. 
three sixths, right? If you get a two, four, or six out of those six numbers, okay? The probability of getting an even number, that's a half, okay? The probability of B occurring, getting a number bigger than three, that's getting the numbers four, five, or six. There's three out of six, and once again, it's a half, okay? But let's think, is the probability of B given A going to be the same as the probability of B, which was a half? Okay, so let's think. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so we roll a die. We want to know the probability of getting a number bigger than three. That is number four, five, or six. Okay, so far there's a 50% chance. Okay, four, five, or six. Okay, but let's say we're given that A is true. Okay, we're given that A is true. So that means that we know it's an even number. Okay, if you know it is an even number, that means it's one of these three. Okay, I roll a die. It came out even. So it's one of these three. Now, what is the probability that it's bigger than three? Well, there's a two out of three chance that it's bigger than three. If we give you the hint, basically, that it is an even number, that means it's either two, four, or six. And so out of those three options, two out of the three are bigger than three. So the probability of B given A is two thirds, where the probability of B is a half. So that means that they're dependent. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and figure out for practice, let's figure out the probability of A given B. Okay, let me get a new set of numbers, one through six. Okay, probability of A given B. We want to know the probability of getting an even number. Okay, the probability of getting an even number was a half. For probability of A given B, we're given that it is bigger than six. Okay, I rolled a die, it came out in there someplace. Okay, now if I tell you that, what is the probability that it's even? Well, out of the numbers in the box, two out of three are even. So it is again a two thirds chance. Since probability of A given B is not the same as the probability of A, they're dependent events. The idea of independent versus dependent can take some getting used to. If you're finding it a little tricky, uh, that's okay and normal, and it's gonna get better with practice and thinking about it. Okay, here's an example with cards. Okay, we're gonna pick a card from a deck of cards and we'll have three events this time. A will be, it's red. B, it's a number card. E, it's clubs. Okay, so let's figure out each of the individual probabilities first. The probability of A, getting a red card. Okay, out of the 52 cards, 26 are red. So that's 26 out of 52, which is a half. Okay, for B, the probability of getting a number card. Okay, probability of getting a number card. Okay, well, out of each rank, there are 13 cards, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine are number cards. Ace doesn't count as a number card, it's an ace. Okay, there are nine number cards. So there are nine thirteenths, the probability of getting a number card. Okay, the probability of getting a card that is clubs. Okay, out of the four suits we have, out of the four suits we have, one is all clubs. So there's a one fourth chance of getting clubs. Okay, all right, so now let's try the probability of B given A. Okay, so we want to know the probability that it is a number card given that it's red. Okay, so let's take a look at the cards. We want to know the probability that it's a number card. 
Okay, the probability that it is a number card, that's B, 9 thirteenths. Okay, probability that it's a number card, 9 thirteenths. Okay, suppose that I give you a little hint. All right, it's red. Okay, does that help you decide any? Does that change anything if I tell you, well, it's red? No, it's still 9 out of 13, right? Because there are an equal proportion of number cards to non-number cards uh, within each suit. So that is still um, 9 thirteenths. Okay, the probability of A given B. Okay, we want to know the probability that it's red. Okay, pick a card. What is the probability that it's red? Okay, half the cards are red. The probability is a half. Okay, suppose that I try to give you a little clue. All right, it's a number card. It's a seven. Okay, does that help you decide if it's red or not? No, because there are an equal number of number cards within each suit. Okay, so that is uh, still one half. Knowing that it's a number card doesn't help you decide if it's red or not. Okay, so we can say that A and B are independent. All right, so let's try B and E. Okay, so the probability of it being a number card given that it's clubs, well, that is still going to be 9 thirteenths, right? If we know that it's clubs, that just says, okay, well, it's one of the cards in that top row out of which nine of them are number cards. So it's still 9 thirteenths, okay? The probability of getting a number card or getting clubs, those are again going to be independent. Let's try A given E. Okay, so the probability of getting a red card was a half. What if we tell you, well, it's clubs? Okay, pick, I picked a card. What is the chance that it's red? It's a half. Okay, what if I give you a little hint and say, well, it's clubs? Is it red? Okay, no, not anymore. There's zero chance that it's uh, red if you know that it's clubs. Similarly, if you want to figure out the probability of E given A, what is the probability that it's clubs given that it's red? Okay, this card of mine is red. What is the chance that it's clubs? It's going to be zero. Okay, the probability of A given E is not the same as the probability of A, and the probability of E given A is not the same as the probability of E. So um, E and uh, A are dependent. Okay. It, like I said, if it takes you a while to get used to that idea of independent versus dependent, uh, that's okay and normal. Uh, frequently people have a little trouble with that uh, subject. If not, that's great. But if you do have a little trouble with it, then that's normal and it'll get better with practice. Uh, you should write down an example of uh, independent and dependent events and then also one where the two events are mutually exclusive. Uh, and then not, so that you can contrast the idea of independence versus not and mutually, ex mutually exclusive versus not. Okay, one more example. Um, when we think about sampling methods that we use in statistics, um, some are uh, lead to independent events and some lead to dependent events. So uh, we can do sampling both with replacement and without replacement. And so we need to talk about what is meant by that. When you do with replacement, what that means is whatever you've sampled gets put back before you draw a second, um, second uh, member from the population. So an example of this would be, let's say you have that bowl of M&Ms and you're gonna pick out four and note their color. And each time you pick one out, you pick it out, okay, it's green. Then you throw it back in the bowl stir and then reach in and pick out another um, M&M. And you do that four times. But each time you're putting the M&M back, which is kind of gross, but you're putting the M&M back um, before you pick out the next one. Okay. Uh, sampling without replacement, 
would be where once a certain member of the population has been sampled, it's not going to be sampled again. An example of that would be where you uh, survey people who are coming out of uh, Walmart and ask them who they're going to vote for for president. Okay, people come out, you say, okay, who are you going to vote for for president? They answer you, you write it down, and then they go and get in their car and leave. Um, you're not going to ask the same person again, right? We're going to assume that that same person doesn't go back into Walmart, shop some more, and come out, and you ask them a second time. Okay, so there the sampling is done without replacement. Okay, going back to the M&M example, if when you pulled the four M&Ms out of the bowl, if you picked one out, hmm, brown, and then wrote it down, and then set it aside or ate it, right, and then picked out another one, noted its color, but didn't put it back, if you don't put it back each time, then that's without replacement. Okay, and so these two types of uh, sampling methods uh, lead us to either independent or dependent events. If the sampling is done with replacement, that is the thing that you took out and looked at. If it's put back, then that's an independent event. Okay, without replacement, the selections are uh, dependent events. Okay, if you don't take, if you don't put it back, then that affects uh, probabilities going forward. Okay, so we have an example that goes with that. All right, so let's try this example. Let's say that uh, you have this little ice chest and it's got in it six sodas. There are three Cokes, two Mountain Dews, and one Dr. Pepper in it. And so you're driving down the road, so you can't take your eyes off the road. You're going to reach into the cooler and pick out uh, sodas. So we're going to pick out two, and we're going to do it without replacement first. We want to know the probability that you first pick out a Coke, and then you pick out a Mountain Dew. Okay, so you're going to get one out, you're going to give it to your friend, and then keep one for yourself. I don't know why she's not getting it out for you. She should if you're driving, but we'll let that go. Okay, so uh, you're picking out two sodas, okay, without replacement. First, it's going to be a Coke, then it's going to, then a Mountain Dew, and it's without replacement. So there are six sodas in there in the first place. The probability that we first get a Coke, there are three sixths, three Cokes out of six total sodas. Okay, since the uh, selection is done without replacement, when you reach in to get the second soda, there are only five cans left, okay, out of which two are Mountain Dews. Okay, so that will be uh, one-fifth or 0.2, the probability. Okay, so what that means, of course, is if you sat and did this over and over again, picking out uh, two sodas from a fresh ice chest each time, that about one out of every five times you'd first get a Coke and then you'd get a Mountain Dew. Okay, so next, let's say you choose two, but you do it with replacement. So that means that out of the first draw, there are six total sodas and three of them are Cokes. But this means that you put that first Coke back. Maybe you didn't want a Coke. So you put the Coke back and you reach in again. Okay, so when you reach in again, there are Mountain Dews, two of them, you were looking for that to happen, getting a Mountain Dew, but there are six sodas in there still because you put the first one back, okay? So then um, that's half of two six, which is one six. So there's a one sixth chance of that occurring and that's about 16%, so about 0.16. Let's say 0.17. Okay, so thinking about that, that should make um, sense, right? In the first case, we reached in, we picked out a Coke, and then you kept that out, and you reached in again and reached for that, or hoped to get that Mountain Dew. 20% chance of that occurring, getting that Mountain Dew on the second pick. Then the other way of doing it, if we do it with replacement, then there's only a 17% chance, approximately, of getting first Coke, then a Mountain Dew. So the probability is lower, so it's less likely. And if you think about it, that should make sense. In the second, in the first case, let's assume for this that you want the Mountain Dew, okay? After you've picked out that first Coke, um, that's kind of out of the way when you reach back in for the second soda and uh, you want it to be a Mountain Dew. In the second case, you've put back that first Coke and so that makes it less likely when you reach in the second time that you end up getting the Mountain Dew. If you think about it, this makes sense and should be consistent with your experience. 
if you're looking for something um, in a bag, like your purse or a backpack or something, um, if you're looking for something, um, it's easier to find it um, if when you pull something out, if it's not what you're looking for, if you leave it out, okay? If you keep picking things out and put them back in your bag, then it makes it harder to find whatever it is until you get, of course, frustrated and dump the whole thing out, okay? Um, moving on. Okay, let's say that we pick three this time and we're going to do it without replacement, okay? So no Mountain Dew the first time, no Mountain Dew the second time, and then uh, third Mountain, uh, Mountain Dew on the third try. Okay, so this time we're picking three sodas, we're doing it without replacement. So there's six sodas, and um, how many are not Mountain Dews? Three Cokes and one Dr. Pepper, that's four that are not Mountain Dew. We're doing it with replacement, so when we go to draw a second time, how many are there? If it's without replacement, there are only five sodas. And since we're assuming that the first time had occurred, that it was not a Mountain Dew, that means that there are only three non-Mountain Dews left. Maybe one of the Cokes, or maybe that Dr. Pepper. Okay, third time through, there are only four sodas left. We're assuming that the first two events have already occurred, that is, we've picked out two cans of soda already, and we want this to be yes on the Mountain Dews. There are two, so a two-fourths chance, finally, of that occurring. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate that. Okay, and that's point two. Okay, and now it, let's say that we do this with replacement. So before we do this, um, you should try to predict which way this is gonna come out. Do you think that it's more likely now that we're going to um, be replacing those non-Mountain Dews uh, before we get to that third one and have it be a Mountain Dew? Or do you think it will, probability will be the same? Okay, so we want to, we're gonna pick again three sodas. The first time it's not gonna be a Mountain Dew, the second time not a Mountain Dew, the third time it will be a Mountain Dew. Okay, so first time there are six sodas and there are four non-Mountain Dews. Okay, and then for the second soda, we're doing this with replacement, so there's still six sodas in there. We put that first one back and that first non-Mountain Dew that we picked out back in the ice chest. So there are four non-Mountain Dews still there. Then finally, when we go to do the last soda, there are six cans of sodas still in there and two of them are Mountain Dews. So uh, let's see how this turns out. So that's 16, 32 out of 216, about 14.8% chance. Okay, so the probability dropped from around from 20% to around 14.8%. So again, that makes it uh, less likely to occur uh, because we're doing this uh, with replacement. All right, so that takes us to the end of our look um, at the multiplication rule uh, for now. Um, we're not quite done with this section yet. We'll have more to do with that. Um, but in the meantime, uh, let me know if you have any questions and have a great day.